Angela's light shone so brightly, even from that narrow Robben Island cell, that in the late 70s, he could inspire a young college student on the other side of the world. Mandela said, young people are capable when aroused of bringing down the towers of oppression and raising the banners of freedom. Now's a good time to be aroused. Let's just acknowledge how dope you have to be for people to keep throwing you birthdays after you're dead. <laughs> and because today marks 100 years since his birth, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the man. All right, he joined politics when he was just 26 years old, partly to fight racial inequality and also because he had just been kicked off his parents' Obamacare. <laughs> now, at first, <laughs> at first, the ANC fought for racial equality peacefully, but the racist government only got more oppressive. In fact, in 1948, South Africa's government set up apartheid, which made legal racism the foundation of the entire country. Black people couldn't vote, they had to live in certain areas, and they were banned from playing sports with white people. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that last part, I completely understand, all right? I mean, if your system is based on white supremacy, you can't have black people dunking all over your shit. <laughs> it just doesn't go with the narrative. Be like, white people are superior. Ah! Oh, wait, I wasn't ready, I wasn't ready. <laughs> In fact, the government became so oppressive that Mandela and the ANC decided to resort to violence. They bombed power stations, post offices, and I mean, they did it when people weren't in there, but still, they blew shit up. And there were many people, not just in South Africa, but around the world, who wanted him to respond to the brutality of the government with civility, to which Mandela replied, bore shit. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and nonviolence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Now, I know for a lot of people seeing a young radical Mandela, that's a bit of a shock. Yeah, it's like finding out one of the Care Bears mauled a hiker to death. <laughs> so, I mean, I'd expect that out of Tenderheart, but you, Funshine? <laughs> but you see, Nelson Mandela believed that violence was necessary to fight a violent government, and he paid a price for it. In 1962, when Mandela was 44 years old, the apartheid government arrested him and sentenced him to life in prison. And what he said in the docs is legendary. He said, I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society. It is an ideal which I hope to live and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Now, Nelson Mandela's story up to that point was impressive, but it's what he did after he came out of prison that transformed him from a leader to a legend, all right? Because when he became South Africa's first black president, he reconciled the country and he insisted that white people be a part of it, right? And you realize, this is a black country and he's the first black president. He could have easily just said, I'll give you white people a 10 minute head start. <laughs> you guys put me in prison for 30 years. I don't even know what a walkman is. <laughs> I just hope I get to meet Elvis. What? <laughs> Five minute head start. <laughs> so, so you see, this is just part of why people like uh, Barack Obama look up to Nelson Mandela. This was a man who grew up in a country, steeped in racism, spent decades in prison fighting it, and then dedicated his life to a world of racial progress. And, most impressively, when he was asked why he's not bitter, he had this to say. You end up coming out of prison, and there is no bitterness. How is there no bitterness? Well, I hated oppression. And when I think about the past, the type of things they did, I feel angry. You have a limited time to stay on Earth. You must try and use that period for the purpose of transforming your country. And that's why he's a legend. You must remember, because of so many of the struggle leaders in South Africa were either imprisoned or exiled, the movement in South Africa was held together in large part by women in the country. And so it's weird for me, because I understand you travel the world, you understand that everywhere feminism is different and the, the idea of women is different. But I grew up in a world that was very matriarchal and where women were the most dangerous freedom fighters that existed. <laughs> no, this is true. You read, up on, you read up on Winnie Mandela, like Nelson Mandela was an icon, but the police in the country were afraid of, of Winnie Mandela. You know, they were, 
And we had a phrase in South Africa that was, we still use it today, which was, watintabafazi, watintimbogoko, which means you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And that's what I grew up learning. That's a, it was kudos, man. It was fire. It was fire. And a lot of the time, my mom would strike me with a rock. And... February 1st, 1965. It's the Black History Month Daily Show. Welcome to The Daily Show. I'm Trevor Noah. My guest tonight, up-and-coming comedian Bill Cosby. <laughs> this guy's jokes are gonna knock you out. But we begin in Selma, Alabama. If you aren't familiar with Selma, it's a small southern city located 10 miles east of No Negroes, Please, and five miles north of Say Boy. And it's also where today recent Nobel Peace Prize winner Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got into some legal trouble. Dateline Selma. Civil rights leader, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested today while attempting to lead a mass march of 300 Negroes on the Dallas County Courthouse to protest voter registration procedures. The Negroes were taken into custody on charges of parading without a permit. For more, we go to our junior civil rights correspondent, Roy Woods Sr. Now, Roy, what did you see out there? I saw a bunch of bulls, Trevor. <laughs> Proud Negro men and women being arrested for no reason. Well, now, Roy, the police said there was a reason. They were parading without a permit. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Did the Klan fill out their paperwork before marching in my neighborhood? <laughs> when have you ever seen white people arrested for parading without a permit? Well, Roy, that's just the world we live in. Black people aren't ever gonna get the same treatment as white people, and that's never gonna change. Actually, Trevor, I don't agree. You have to look at the bright side of things. Yeah. Maybe the cops arrested Dr. King and a bunch of our brothers and sisters, but they did it this time without violence. That's progress. I mean, 40 years ago, a white man wouldn't even give a black man a glass of water. Now, not only can we have water, we can get it whether we want it or not. Well, I mean, you, I guess you could call that progress. Oh, I do call that progress. We've gone from lynchings to beatings, now to peaceful arrests. In fact, I heard Dr. King is coming back right here next month to Selma to march across that bridge, and at the rate of progress we making, I bet you it's gonna be a fun day marching arm in arm with the police, and one day they'll make a movie about it, and it'll be called Selma, the day when nothing happened at all. For more on Dr. King's legacy, we turn now to Dulce Sloan, everybody. <laughs> Dulce. What are you thinking? What are you remembering about Dr. King's legacy? You know what I want to remember? The real Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, not the whitewashed, hallmark version. Because every year, people talk about the same stuff. The I Have a Dream speech, the March on Washington, how he had the voice of a Scooby-Doo ghost. <laughs> I have a dream. <laughs> and I would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for those meddling kids. <laughs> But the real Dr. King did not fit in any box. White moderates think he would have been on their side, but he thought they were worse for the civil rights movement than the Klan. And mattress stores are out here having MLK Day sales, but Dr. King was anti-capitalist. And even though he was a reverend and a man of God, he allegedly had a whole bunch of affairs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. hold on, hold on. Even if that's true, I mean, that he, that he had affairs, isn't it disrespectful to mention that on his birthday? I don't think so. It's part of his legacy. A reminder that our heroes aren't perfect, they're people. And I'm not being disrespectful. <laughs> Just the opposite. MLK was out there getting it. <laughs> and probably still could. I mean, if he showed up on my Bumble, I'd take him to the mountaintop <laughs> in the valley low. I've never thought of MLK on Bumble. Well, he wouldn't be on Tinder. That man had class. <laughs> if everyone knew that fighting for civil rights could get you some, a lot more people would fight for equality, equal pay, voting rights, and whoever can stop black people from getting shot by the police will f tonight, okay? <laughs> This week marked a milestone in civil rights history. The 50th anniversary of Franklin's first appearance <laughs> in the comic strip Peanuts. Now, now, it seems like a joke, but the reason this was a landmark is that before Franklin appeared, newspaper comic strips were segregated. 
right? Black comic strips were always separate, separate from white comic strips. Uh, in fact, if you even tried to put the pages of the newspaper together, the police would just break down your door. <laughs> and you'd be like, whoa! And they'd be like, well, 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 we got a troublemaker over here. <laughs> So, the character of Franklin was a pretty big deal. And what's really fascinating is his origin story. April 1968, Martin Luther King had been shot and killed. American cities burned in rage. In California, a 42-year-old teacher and mother of three felt helpless. And I remember sitting in suburbia saying, is there anything I can do? Harriet Glickman wanted to reach someone with influence. She wrote to Charles Schultz. His Peanuts comic strip was read by nearly 100 million people each week. Charlie Brown, Lucy, Linus, they were all white. Glickman told Schultz he should integrate. Okay, that was pretty dope of that lady, but, uh... <laughs> yeah, but... But at the same time, also kind of a weird reaction to a tragedy. I mean, Martin Luther King is dead, there's chaos in the streets, and her first reaction is, maybe Charlie Brown can help. <laughs> For more on this civil rights trailblazer, we turn now to our very own Roy Wood Jr., everybody! <laughs> Roy, no matter who you are, uh, you gotta love Franklin, right? Oh, man, love him? Are you kidding, man? Franklin was a straight-up G. Integrated the shit out of Peanuts. Yeah, and it must have been a pretty big moment for you as a kid when he first appeared in the strip. First appeared? That was in 1968. How old do you think I am? 50... 40? 60? I'm 39, Trevor. 39. Here's the thing. Newspaper Franklin was great. Newspaper Franklin was great. You can't argue that. But when they put him on TV, it was a different story. All of a sudden, they made him a stereotype. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. <laughs> it's all about my coffee cup and the shoes. We're the team invincible and we're not gonna lose. Franklin just do the hokey pokey, Trevor. <laughs> you telling me black kids can't put their left foot in and take their left foot out? It looked like Franklin was auditioning for House Party, too. Yeah, but Roy, but Roy, yeah. it, it's still cool to have him in there, even if he had one dance break. It was every time with this kid. Anytime you walk down the street in Peanutsville, you might run into Franklin and his homeboy pop locking. <laughs> And even when he's hanging out with his friends, everyone else gets a normal handshake, but no, not Franklin. He got a slap skin. See what I mean? All the other peanuts are just kids, but Franklin's running around Peanutville like a damn baby shaft. <laughs> he's a tiny, bad mother... Shut your mouth! I'm talking about Franklin. Look, I just don't want him to be the other kid all the time. Even at Thanksgiving, yeah, they invited him, but look where they put him. <laughs> He's by himself. Even the dog gets to sit with the kids. Why is the dog even at the damn table? <laughs> it's cool, though, Franklin. Franklin, look, man, Franklin, they did you a favor. You don't want none of that bland-ass white people turkey anyway. Oh, man, today was a, a day when we got some really sad news that uh, Aretha Franklin passed away. That was, uh, yeah, that was... It was rough for a lot of people, and not just because of the music, because of who she was. I remember I used to, like, I used to sing the songs with my mom. So I grew up, you know, it was, most of the time it was just me and my mom. And so I used to sing all the songs, not really knowing what they meant, per se. So as a little kid, I was, like, confident, like, you make me feel like a <laughs> natural woman. <laughs> and then, like, I got, I got older, and I was just like, whoa, wait, what was I doing? What was I... <laughs> I was like, Mom, why didn't you stop me? And she's like, because you look like a natural woman. You were doing so well. <laughs> but what, what I loved is, like, like Aretha Franklin, and, you, you know, you see everybody talking about this, is it, it's one of those examples where you see an artist who uses their platform to go beyond just making money and doing what they do. Like, you read these beautiful stories about how Aretha Franklin had it in her contract that she wouldn't perform for segregated audiences, right? So, you know, if audiences were segregated by ratios, like, no, I'm, I'm not going to perform. 
Um, you know, she was one of the first uh, people who supported Angela Davis, you know, from the Black Panthers. She fought for Martin Luther King. Like, this is at a time when it wasn't cool to do that. It was risky to you and your livelihood. I mean, you saw what happened with Nina Simone, you know? And she was out there and she was doing it. And she was making songs that at the time were crazy when you think of how women were situated in society. I mean, you know, the Me Too movement has shown that we still have a long way to go. But at that time, it was pretty much like women just keep quiet. And she was out there in R-E-S-P-E-C-T was, I mean, I remember that as well. That, like, my mom used to say that to me <laughs> as like, like if I'd ever like say something, back chat or whatever, and then my mom would be like, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And she's like, play the song, and I'd be like, yeah, R-P-S-P-E-S-P-E-S-T. <laughs> Find out what. And she was, you know what I loved about Aretha as well? Is like the stories that she was gangster. Like she full on, she only performed when she had her money in cash before the gig. <laughs> Always. Like that, her whole life, till like now, till she was like, where's the money? Like she was the original bitch better have my money. <laughs> money, before the gig, then I sing. Like, I sometimes think to myself, like, the girl's backstage counting it, and she's, like, doing it word by word. You and I, no and hiding. Home, ho. So, yeah, man, she will, she'll be missed. She will be. Everything we see today, in, in so many ways, in the music, in, like, you know, music, male and female, is because of her. So, Aretha Franklin, rest in peace, man. It's a beautiful, beautiful story.